Welcome to this lecture on digital communication using GNU radio. My name is Kumar Appaya and I belong to the Department of Electrical Engineering at IIT Bombay. In this lecture, we are going to see how noise and related ideas can be brought into GNU radio. In particular, we will see the noise source in GNU radio and various properties that it has in particular, how it behaves when you have real noise or complex noise. We will then also introduce the concept of matched filtering as a way by which we can average out the noise to minimize its impact for various kinds of pulses and this will go into making your receiver efficient. So in this lecture, we are going to inspect the impact of match filtering from a noise perspective. One key idea is that if you take any pulse that is used for signaling, for example, in this case, we are taking a partial ramp signal and let us say that this ramp is used to send data. Now, unfortunately, the ramp is going to get affected by noise and you're going to have this wavy pulse at the receiver. Now, if everything were good and you wanted to find out what data was sent, you can ideally just look at this particular point because that has the highest amplitude. But for some reason, if the noise is very high in that particular point and takes you to another value, you may make a mistake. You are also making an error by not taking into account all of these possible values. So the key idea is for us to take all of these values into consideration in order to determine which particular amplitude was sent. Let's say that you send a ramp from 0 to 1, a ramp with a different amplitude from 0 to 2 and so on. So you have to find out which exact value was sent by looking at the whole duration over here. So the key idea is that you have to take the weighted average of the noisy samples. Now, why should you take the weighted average and not the average? The reason is because over here, the amplitude of the ramp is very high. And even if there is noise, the noise is not going to carry the signal or carry the value far down or you know far away from the desired value. But over here, if you look at the points near zero, the noise could cause a huge shift. For example, let us say that the amplitudes we have are 0, 1, 2, 3. Then over here, it will be 0, 1, 2, 3 in very close succession. And the noise may end up carrying you to the wrong amplitude and make you make more errors. So in some sense, these all these measurements, which you can see over here, are measurements of the actual value except that they have different SNRs. And it turns out that if you look at the match filter theory, they say that the match filter, that is that filter which you have to choose or that combination of these values that you have to choose is basically weighted in such a way that you give these low SNR points a smaller weightage and a higher SNR points a higher weightage. Therefore, from the perspective of maximizing the signal to noise ratio by combining all these optimally, what should you do? It turns out that you have to essentially weight these values exactly by the amplitude of the ramp. So you're going to multiply this value by this particular amplitude, this by this, this by this and add all of them up, which basically translates to multiplying the ramp or rather the noisy ramp by the clean ramp and then performing the averaging. That is, the optimal weight is the amplitude itself. This is why matched filter theory also tells you that this particular approach gives you the best SNR maximizing solution where that takes into account all the values with appropriate SNRs. An exercise you can think of is that if you take a rectangular pulse, which we will do soon, then you can weight all the points as they are, I mean all the points equally because every point has in equal SNR. Now, the other point which we will look at is that the other point that we have to consider is that we want to implement match filtering, which is effectively correlation as a convolution. How do we do that? So let's stick with our S of T. 
if this is our s of t if we essentially want to perform convolution we consider s of t minus tau and multiply it out unfortunately s of t minus tau will be the flipped rectangle that is it will be flipped triangle rather the ramp essentially going from up to down instead but if we look at s of tau minus t instead that is the exact uh, you know signal that we want it's essentially if you look, take this as s of tau this is of tau minus t which means it is shifted by t along this axis and if you choose t as 0 this is s of tau that's exactly what you have over here and if you now look at this particular overlap you can see that this is the convolution of s of t with s of minus t sampled at 0 in other words you're taking s of t flipping it convolving it and taking it at 0 offset of course, in a causal implementation, there may be more other delays, but this is the way by which you can visualize that the correlation can be implemented as convolution by just taking S of t, flipping it and using it for convolution with S of t. We will now inspect this briefly in GNU radio. Let us now put together a very simple example of match filtering just to send some bit of let's say pulse amplitude modulated data and recover it by using match filtering in the presence of noise. So before we go ahead let us just look at how this can be done and how we can actually make a particular pulse and then get the particular get the data back from that particular pulse. I am going to first use a bit of a, some numpy functions so I am going to just do control f for command f and I am going to say import and for convenience we will just double click this and say import numpy as np so that we don't have to keep typing numpy dot numpy dot all the while now for simplicity let me take a vector source so control f for command f we take vector source yes we have a vector source uh, i'll do a real simulation so we'll just say float um, I need to get my pulse over here. So I'm going to take a fairly long pulse so that we can visualize things easily. And I want to use the pulse in multiple locations. So I'm not going to use this particular, I'm not going to hard code the pulse within the vector source. I'm going to do control F for command F and say variable. And I'm just going to double click and call it my pulse. That's my variable name and the pulse I'm going to use is a ramp. So I'm going to create a ramp by just adding numbers in a sequence in NumPy. So np.a range and uh, maybe let's take the ramp from 0 to 1 in let's say 400 samples. So let's say 400 samples and I want to take it from 0 to close to 1. So I'll say by 400. In fact, it should be 399, but let's because np.a range gives you the numbers from 0 through 399, but I think that's okay. Maybe if you want, we can. Okay, let us stick with this. Now, just to have an intuition, 32k is the sample rate. That means each sample is separated by 1 by 32,000 seconds. 400 by 32,000 seconds implies that this particular ramp is going to last about 400 by 32,000 seconds that works out to I think uh, 4 by 320 seconds that works out I think 1 by 80th of a second we will just confirm now let us just put my pulse over here as the variable name we'll add a throttle control F for command F we will grab a throttle <coughs> double click this should be a float Next, we will grab a time sync. Control F or Command F. And if you type time, you get a QTGUI time sync. We double click this, call it float. For now, let us live with this. This is just to visualize our pulse and verify that it is correct. If I execute this flow graph, I get this kind of pulse. Uh, let us just make things more convenient. So I'm going to double click this time sync and I'm going to make it have a grid and I'm going to make it auto scale. Okay. And uh, we can actually make this, let's say, um, yeah, this is fine actually. So 
we can make this a multiple of uh, this you know 400 to just have it static if say 1 2 0 0 is the number of points now you can see that you have these now the question is what is the gap between or what is the gap between this so this is 0 and we have over here 12.5 milliseconds 12.5 milliseconds now if you do the maths 400 upon 32000 is 4 upon 320 that is 1 upon 80 1 upon 80 that is 1000 upon 80 milliseconds and 1000 upon 80 milliseconds you can verify will be 12.5 milliseconds so this is actually like sending 1111 but we want to send some data that we will do momentarily and it goes from 0 to 1 comes down goes from 0 to 1 comes down and so on this is good so now when we want to do something like matched filtering we want to essentially convolve this pulse with its uh, its flipped version in this case notice that i have chosen the ramp specifically because this is an unsymmetric pulse if you have a symmetric pulse like a sink or a root trace cosine or a rectangular pulse you can just convolve with itself but now you have a pulse which is non symmetric so let us actually do conduct an exercise let us now just perform let's take some data and then perform this so i'm going to remove this vector source i'm going to do control f for command f type random get a random source now a random source we'll say the random source takes 0 1 2 3 so four possible values okay now we need to just we can just take these 0 1 2 3 values as our float as well so i'm just going to take an int to float so control f for command f i'm going to type int to float grab this block connect it over here now i need to essentially put this pulse or uh, put this pulse for this data and i have chosen 400 specifically uh, i have not uh, let me let me maybe make that a variable m so that we don't have any issues i'll call this capital m i'll call this capital m and i'll say control f for command f i'll say variable i'll double click this call this variable m and make it 400 so now we need to essentially put zeros and then convolve zeros in between these samples and convolve it with this particular variable to do that we will use the interpolating fir filter so control f for command f i'll type interpolating i'll grab the interpolating fir filter double click the interpolating fir filter we'll go with float to float we'll call the interpolation amount 400 and the taps we will basically make it exactly my pulse now what will this result in this will result in a successive sequence of ramps each multiplied by either 0 or 1 or 2 or 4 one after the other now this number of points may actually be may you may, may need to increase this but let's just run it and check <coughs> yeah so you can see that it is working but let us increase the number of points okay let's make this about uh, let's say 12,000 we'll make it 12,000 if you make it 12,000 and let me just stop you can see what is happening you have let's say a 0 then you have a 2 and then you have a 1 and a 2 and maybe another 1 and then a 3 and so on let's actually try to look at what the gap between successive peaks is over here over here this is i think 225 milliseconds this is 237.5 that's again 12.5 milliseconds so the gap between these is 12.5 milliseconds which is consistent with the way you have designed your pulse your pulse was designed to be 25 you know 12.5 milliseconds so each successive modulated data ramp is 12.5 milliseconds long now the challenge for us is to get back this data okay now to get, get back this data we need to do the reverse operation we need a decimating fir filter and this decimating fir filter will essentially take this output and we will try to we'll try to get back our random source points so let's do control f for command f type decimating 
grab the decimating FIR filter, double click it, we want float to float, we want a decimation factor of M actually, actually I should have typed M in your uh, um, interpolating also, we will do that and I will call it. Now here is something which we have to be careful about. When we want to do a decimating, we're decimating filter, let's keep the decimation at one. We are not going to do any decimation. Let us now put the tabs as my pulse, colon, colon, minus one. Colon, colon, minus one is Python notation for reversing a sequence. So what does this do? This takes into account the fact that your pulse is being reversed because the filters always perform convolution. You want correlation you are essentially reversing the pulse. Let's say OK. We will double click this. We will call this M. I missed that. All right. Now, let us actually just get another QT GUI time sync. I'm going to double click this first and say this name is interpolated. And then I'm going to just grab another QT GUI time sync by doing control F and say time and grab another QT UI time sync. We will double click this, call it float, call it decimated. Okay. It's not yet decimated, but still bear with me. We will add a grid. We will do auto scale, say okay. Now I am going to just take the output of the interpolating FIR filter. I'll take it out from the throttle. Doesn't matter. Connect it to the QT UI time sync and we will check what happens. Okay, so as you can see, there are these peaks which you get. Why are these peaks coming? The reason these peaks are coming is because this particular pulse is essentially being convolved with the decimating filter and that results in these peaks. And notice also there is an interesting happening. The time over here, time scale is from 0 to 350 while here the time scale is 0 to 30. This is effectively because there is a factor, um, you know, there's a factor multiplication because you have decimated. That's or you're, you know, you're going to decimate. That's the reason why this particular thing happens. Just be aware of this. The reason, I mean, the actual reason is because I've chosen different time scales. Here I've chosen 12k. Here I've chosen 1.024k. So maybe if I really wanted to make it somewhat consistent, because I'm decimating by a factor of four, 400. I will have to make this 12,000 by 400, but I'm sticking to the number of points over here. It doesn't matter. Now, now the key thing is that if I stop this, if you look at these values over here, maybe uh, let's just make this slightly longer. We'll make this also some uh, 3000 and let's run this and I'm going to stop this. So the values over here are close to 400. Here the value is close to 138, here the value is close to, you know, uh, 267, you know. So the values seem to be close to 0, 130, 130 or so, um, 266 and close to 400. What is the cause? The reason for this is because when you actually perform an overlap of the original pulse with this particular decimating filter, you're actually going to get a, the, va the value that you're going to get the, is actually the integral or this autocorrelation of the function evaluated at zero. In other words, you're going to get the integral of the square of the signal. Let's actually just verify that. Temporarily, let me remove this particular connection. Then let us grab a vector source. So control F or command F. We'll say vector source and in the vector source, let us actually put our pulse. So I'll say float and I'm going to say my pulse. And let's see what happens with this correlation. So this particular operation is just essentially taking the pulse, multiplying by itself and moving it also in time. So if I run this, I get this kind of thing uh, to make it stable and static. I need to double click this, uh, I need to basically take care of the length. So this is uh, the length of this is about uh, 400. The length of this is about 400. So maybe I'm just going to make this, let's say 
Uh, let me try making this 800. Yeah, so now this is very, very stable. So now what happens is that this particular peak is actually a value which is around, let me uh, zoom in over here or let me maybe zoom in like this. It's like 133 or something like that. Okay, why is it 133? What is the significance of this value? It turns out that this particular highest value occurs when you overlap the peak of the ramp with itself. Recall from the slide, you are overlapping the ramp with itself, which means you are essentially multiplying the ramp samples by themselves and adding them up. Now, therefore, what you get is actually the sum square of the my pulse coefficients. If you don't believe me, let's grab a variable, control F or command F, type variable. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to double click this and just say np dot sum that adds a vector my pulse star star 2 that basically performs the square of the every element of the vector and this adds them and that it gives you 132.834. If you now look closely at the output you get over here, this is going to be close to 132.8 it's because I'm not able to put my finger on the right location you get it so I think it must be close to 132.8 over here yeah it's close to 132.8 at the peak okay so then if you really want to get back the original samples we can just scale it by adding a scale over here I'm just going to scale it by dividing this I'm going to divide by np dot sum my pulse squared <clears throat> now if i execute this after doing the match filtering i get a nice one now our task is to add noise and recover the original pulse but before we go there notice that there's a slight you know this essentially there is a slight uh, you know there's a one and then it goes down there's a one and then it goes down and so on okay this is because of the periodic convolution. That is something we'll have to just handle. Now let us get rid of, uh, before we go further, let's also add the decimation. I'm going to make the decimation 400 or M. If I do this in this case, I get a value close to one. Uh, this is slightly inac inaccurate because it should be exactly one because we got the exact value over there. So, one thing we can do is we can try to add a sample delay and see whether that helps. Okay. Or we can try to just, uh, we can just remove the sample delay over here. We can try to add a delay over here. Say control F or command F and we'll say delay. As always, we'll grab a delay. We can double click this delay, make it an integer delay sorry make it a float rather and the delay will make it a variable d e l a y now connect this connect this and we'll have a range control f for command f we'll type range we'll add a qt gui range id will be delay and it will be a value between let's say one and default value let's say zero we'll say we'll go between one and m step one this is fine uh, type should be int by the way. Now if we execute this flow graph, this is close to 1 but not exactly 1. If we now take it, take this delay over here and keep going, it you can see that you're essentially changing the sampling point and as you get, get to 400, you get close to 1 again. As you get to 0, you get to 1. So if I set it at 1, then exactly it matches this. It exactly matches this value. If there is no delay, there is a slight offset. Now, why is this the case? The reason is because if you don't add a delay, then if you convolve my pulse with itself, let's say that you don't, let's remove this decimation and set it to one. If you run this, you will see that this particular peak actually starts at one, 
but it is the first point and if you really want to catch that point you have to add a delay of one so if you don't add this delay then the sampling point is slightly off which is why if you add this decimation you have to add a delay if you don't see you know if you see over here you just have to add a delay of one so for now what we'll do is we'll add this delay we'll make the default value as one and then we are set let us now move on to the task of recovering our original data to do that let us get rid of this vector source and let's connect this particular thing over our output over here and let us see whether we are able to get our original data back if i now execute this flow graph we will wait a little for the samples to accrue after you wait you have to wait for a period you are able to see that <coughs> your samples seem to be coming through the values are zero uh, let's stop this middle click and stop value is zero this value is one this value is two this value is three so the samples seem to be coming let's actually execute this the reason why it takes time is because you have this is a multi-rate kind of flow graph because this part is operating much slower because it needs 400 samples and decimates that's why it takes time for you to get the samples okay so let us now actually make it equal to 1000 so that we can compare our data directly let's actually also add another uh, let's say input and let us connect the output of the int to float directly over here okay so i want to you to be able to see that it's actually happening correctly so now if i now execute this flow graph we'll have to wait because it you have to wait for this buffer to get filled up and only then it will display the samples once i get it i will pause now i'm going to just say stop now if you zoom in you are going to see some other effect you are going to see that there is another delay actually the pulses look very very similar the in fact the red pulse is the original but and the green pulse is <coughs> uh, you know green pulse the blue pulse is the recovered the samples look pretty okay but there is definitely a delay now what is the cause of this delay now once again your ramp is causal because your ramp is causal if you now convolve the ramp with itself and sample that sampling point is one sample away let us now look back at our presentation so you can see that this particular sample is one one symbol away from the start of the pulse which means that you have to account for this extra delay so to account for this extra delay the secret for you is to just add another delay over here of one so the way we are going to do it is to just add a delay in this link so let's remove this particular this connection over here and move the delay up move this here we'll make a copy of the delay using control c and control v connect these in this manner just to make it easy for you to discern what is happening we'll just move these around and now if you execute this flow graph and keep waiting for this particular link to this particular plot to settle you will see that the delay is essentially handled you can see that the delay is gone because we have addressed the causal nature of the matched filter so this addresses that issue now the next thing to do is to see the impact of noise now as you are aware noise uh, actually in not directly but noise affects the performance using snr so the signal to noise ratio is what determines the impact of noise over here the waveform takes values of this form you know it takes values between 0 and 1200 because of the way we have constructed the ramp so let's actually see how noise in, uh, you know plays a role and how the match filter handles the noise by means of averaging to do this we will add a noise source in between the interpolating fir filter and the decimating fir filter which does the match filtering so we'll take our usual approach of adding a uh, range first control f for command f will say range 
So we'll take a QTGUI range, call it noise STD, and we'll say this starts from zero uh, and stops at three. I think stops at three is fine, okay? But when we add a noise source, let's actually add the noise source over here. We'll delete this. Let's say control F for command F. We'll say noise. Okay. Now, what we'll do is we'll actually normalize it to have the pulse uh, energy also. So I'm going to actually say this is noise STD times, and I'm going to say NP dot SQRT, NP dot sum. Okay. So I'm going to take the square root of the energy of the pulse. So I'm going to say my pulse square. So this essentially will normalize the SNR to the pulse energy. So now I will also make it float and I'll grab an add block, control F for command F, we'll say add and we'll just make the add float. We'll connect the noise over here and now we are set and let us wait. Of course, uh, the impact of noise will not be visible directly. Let's actually set the noise to something like this and keep waiting. You can see that the noise is affecting your signal significantly. And you can see the impact of noise clearly over here because the signal is quite affected. So this is a very high amount of noise. It's, uh, I think we should make the noise step a little better. It should step by 0 0.1. So now let's execute the flow graph and make it 0 0.2 Even 0 0.2 seems high because of our normalization but let's keep it at 0 0.1 and if you keep waiting you will see that the impact of noise essentially shows over here it's still able to average out the noise significantly even though the waveform is hardly discernible over here it's able to average it out and the averaging significantly reduces the impact of noise so the match filter is able to extract out your signal even amidst this kind of high amount of noise. Let us now just quickly check another pulse. Let's use the uh, rectangular pulse. So I'll say np.1s. So this is just a rectangular pulse which is you know which is consists of 400 ones. So now if you look at your pulse, you have these rectangles. Now if you add some noise, you will see that the noise affects you significantly. And let's see what happens now. On the right side, you will see because of the noise, there is there are these variations. But those variations are still small and you are able to largely discern the signal. If you increase the noise, which you will see in the right, you can hardly make out the signal over here. Over here, however, you are able to see the averaging come into play and you are able to discern it somewhat. So in this way, even in the presence of noise, the match filter does a proper weighted averaging of the waveform samples to give you the best possible result. And this is the key idea behind the design of the match filter as a correlator. So you have seen how the match filter works and the impact of the causal delay in this particular GNU radio experiment. In this lecture, you have used GNU radio in order to simulate the effect of noise and add noise to signals and study the impact of how this noise essentially affects your signals. In the concept of match filtering, you have seen how match filters can effectively combine the received symbols which are a received signal that is affected by noise to get your signals, to get your symbols without much symbol error. Measuring this is something that we will see in the subsequent lectures.